Welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. My name is Glenn Taransky. I am a member of the advisory board here at One Business World. Leading Entrepreneurs of the World features entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders presenting on cutting edge topics and the latest in industry developments. Today, we're very pleased to welcome leading entrepreneur, speaker, CEO, trainer, and coach, Samantha Carlin. Samantha is a professional speaker. Her background spans the public and private sectors uh, from tech to politics to foreign affairs. She was most recently an executive at a venture-backed tech startup in Silicon Valley in charge of global community. Before that, Samantha was the director of global engagement and gender equality at Ashoka, where she supported world-renowned women social entrepreneurs. She has formally built coalitions for the Hillary for America campaign, managed the gender portfolio for the U.S. Embassy in Bosnia-Herzegovina, developed leadership programs for low-income students at Lumne in Peru, and fought extremism anti and anti-Semitism with the American Jewish community in New York City. She's an expert in gender equality with the New American Foundation. She's also active with the Canavan Research Foundation, which funds research and treatment for pediatric genetic brain disease. Samantha is trained in mediation. She's been a TED speaker and hosts the show, Samantha Politics, a political talk show about global politics and women's rights. Uh, Samantha has been a DEI trainer for Corn Ferry and Equal Reality in addition to her own firm. She's worked with a number of companies ranging from Verizon, RB Global, and Coldwell Banker, as well as Fidelity, just to name a few. Uh, so Samantha, it's great to be with you today. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to your presentation here on the changing face of leadership. So let me hand it off to you. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing your presentation and then I'll join you on the back end and we'll have a, a conversation, okay? Glenn, thank you so much for having me. And you know, it's funny as you say, having people that are on the cutting edge, I think um, as something I've always been kind of an early adopter, I've always been an innovator uh, and I am very, very proud uh, the last year of my life, which I'll expand on more throughout my presentation, but I. I genuinely do feel like I'm on the cutting edge of leadership uh, and diversity and inclusion, and it's it's very exciting. So, thank you so much for having me. It's I'm, I'm really delighted to be here and to talk about really important issues. So today's topic is called the changing face of leadership. So I think what's really important to understand here is that what we need from leaders, what leaders are, who they need to be, has drastically shifted in the past 10 years, but especially since the beginning of COVID. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is what are you going to learn today? Oh, these are my socials. If you wanna follow me or quote me or anything on social, my Twitter is at Samantha Paul. Uh, Instagram is at Samantha Politics, and that's youtube.com slash C slash Samantha Politics. That is the talk show where I talk about foreign policy from a feminist lens and host uh, mostly women in foreign policy and national security to critically analyze global politics and US foreign policy decisions. I hope you'll consider subscribing to my YouTube channel to support that important work. So the world has shifted. And I kind of came to this realization a while ago about leadership when I said, wow, every leadership book I've ever written was from a white Western male. Not to say that white Western men don't have anything to say about leadership, but what I realized is that there's so many other people out there that have something to say about leadership and we weren't hearing from them. Every Harvard Business School case study, I'm sure you've read them if you've gone to business school, features a white Western male who went to Wharton or Harvard. What is the message that that sends to the general population? That if you are not a white man who went to Wharton or Harvard, you're not worthy of being a leader or you're not worthy of being a case study. So that's something that I'm really trying to change. But I think it's so important as leaders that we're so aware of the things that are happening in the world because they all have uh, they all have an effect on, on who we need to be as leaders, what traits we need to emphasize, and how we need to be with our people in order to be the best leaders possible. So today you're going to discover the shifts happening in the world today that necessitate this new style of leadership, how the face of leadership is literally changing, and the top five things that every leader needs in 2021 and going forward into the future. 
So first let's talk about some of these trends that we've seen. So the most obvious one being the COVID-19 global pandemic. COVID was so unique because it really did touch every corner of the globe and it didn't discriminate. And you know, even if you are rich, it doesn't mean you're not going to die from COVID, that you can somehow, um, you know, not get COVID. Certainly in certain countries, it did mean that you may have been able to get a hospital bed or get access to oxygen, but it doesn't mean that you can pay off the disease not to kill you. So what are the phenomena that happened with regards to COVID-19 and this global pandemic that we've been facing? Grief, a lot of sadness. A lot of people have died. I, I was just, I live in Washington, DC and I was in this field the other day and they put uh, these little flags for every person that's died of COVID-19 and it is just fields filled with white flags. It's, it's, it's actually staggering. Uh, like something like 360,000 people. We think about 9-11, that was about 2,000 people, right? The amount of people that have died from COVID in the U.S. is just unbelievable. And everybody knows somebody has had someone die in their family or knows someone who has passed up COVID. So we've been dealing with a lot of grief. Obviously, remote work. All these companies that said, we're never going to do remote work, all of a sudden, there was no choice because people were dying and just dropping off. So all of a sudden this world where you now have to lead and you don't necessarily see your people face to face every day. Social isolation, the, the isolation that people have felt has just been staggering. I was just reading a report about depression and social isolation was very, very much linked to depression during COVID. Um, just not having community, not having people to talk to, not having, not having support systems. Uh, the pandemic placed an emphasis on healthcare workers and essential workers. We've realized how important it is to have doctors and nurses and PAs and the people that bring us our food when we can't leave the house. There's been a massive she session. The number of women that left the workforce during COVID or were forced out is tremendous. I mean, it set back a lot of the progress that women had been making, especially within the United States in terms of we were the majority in the workforce and now we are not because of COVID as speaking about women. And then obviously the care burden that is accumulated on women that was already bad Women already do the majority of unpaid care work, but then with kids home from school, you saw women trying to do their full-time job and also trying to get their kid online for school and make sure their other kid doesn't fail and help with the homework. And, you know, it's it, 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 very, very, very difficult times, especially for women who are still the majority caretakers. The inefficiencies of the healthcare systems, I think in a lot of places, um, it's exposed how we weren't ready for this. Even in the United States, which is you know one of the most developed countries in the world, our hospital systems, we were not ready for this. We're still not ready for this. We still have in the South hospital beds that are just completely full. Um, and it, it's just, it's unbelievably staggering. And that's within the United States. Within other countries, uh, the healthcare system's on the verge of collapsing. If you look at Brazil, if you look at Cuba, if you look at India, I mean, the, the pandemic caused these systems to virtually collapse. I, I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable. And one thing that also became clear is that female leaders came out on top. All of the studies that said, oh, which countries are doing the best in the pandemic was all female-led countries. So what is that about? Something else that's happened in the last 10 years that I think is really of note, you know, I've had this talk show for about a year now, Samantha Politics, I've probably covered at least 30 countries and I look a lot at protest movements and it's just striking because it's like they're everywhere. They're in Venezuela and Cuba and Belarus and the US and Argentina and Lebanon and Chile. There's protests everywhere, even under authoritarian regimes where you know, I did an interview with, with women in Cuba and secret police will sit outside their house to try to prevent them from going to a protest, arrest them immediately, put them in prison. Same thing, Belarus, massive amounts of torture. And people are still standing up. 
So what does that say about trends is that people want their voices heard. People don't want to be in a society or under leadership that they don't feel like hears or listens to their voices. That's incredibly important because it has effects within the workplace as well. People don't want to follow someone just because the person says, oh, I'm the leader. Okay, that doesn't just give you instant credibility anymore. And seeing that a lot of people have been able to organize and get out of that fear cycle and still stand up to these authoritarian regimes, I think is just incredibly inspiring and really tremendous. Climate change. I think climate change has been so startling because it's everywhere. I was in Lake Tahoe a few weeks ago. Excuse me, I was in um, San Francisco and I saw a friend who I know lives in Lake Tahoe. What are you doing in San Francisco? I was evacuated. Well, when can you go back? I don't know. Well, what happens if you can't afford a place in, you know, in San Francisco and in Lake Tahoe? Oh, there's, you know, centers. You're basically staying in the version of a homeless center. The, the fires that have ripped through California and then across the world, you see Germany flooding and the Netherlands. And then there's droughts happening in Syria and the Middle East and Africa that are causing conflicts. I think climate change is a really important issue to look at because again, we see just like with COVID-19, it is a problem that is so big that one leader cannot solve it. One country cannot solve climate change. Everybody has to participate. Everybody has to agree to certain regulations. There have to be enforcement measures. There has to be a caring about humanity and about the environment enough that governments will put it forward over profit. So another really big trend. Within the United States, we've seen a rise in societal division. I'm standing here in Washington, DC. January 6th, there was an armed insurrection against the United States Capitol. It, it was so staggering. I cannot even explain to you the fact that people that were armed with weapons and knives and guns broke into the US Capitol, were beating up police officers, were spreading feces all over floors of one of our most honored buildings. Uh, and so that's the other situation. It's not just that we're more politically divided. We have an extremist movement that is growing in the US that is terrifying. And it is so scary that it is to the point where the Department of Homeland Security has said that the biggest threat to United States national security at this point is not external, it is internal. It is domestic terrorism. Okay, so let that land. That's a big deal. Our threat model has moved from external to right within us. And it's very difficult for people to talk to each other across political parties, extremely difficult. Social media, another big phenomena. So one thing about social media that I think you know, makes a difference for the workplace is that everybody has a voice. You, know, you can go on Twitter right now and share your opinion and you know, however many followers you have will hear it. And then maybe it'll be retweeted and then 100, another 100,000 followers will, will hear that. So by everybody having a voice in social media, when they go to the workplace, they expect to have a voice. They don't expect to go to the workplace and go, oh, okay, do your job, don't talk. Nobody wants to hear from you. It doesn't work like that anymore because people are used to being on social media and having a voice. That's one aspect of social media. The other aspect of social media is the organizing capacity that it's incredibly, it's gotten a lot easier to organize. So social media is very much linked to the protest movements. The other aspect of social media that is quite troublesome and worrying is disinformation. We just saw this week in Washington, DC, you know, this economist headline, Facebook is nearing a reputational point of no return. A whistleblower basically saying, Facebook bought profit before people. They care more about making money for shareholders than they do about teenage girls wanting to kill themselves because they see girls skinnier than them on Instagram and have self-esteem issues and suicidal ideation. They don't care about that, okay? They care about profit. None of the social media companies are nonprofits. They are all profit-driven companies. None of them are B Corps. 
None of them are there to do social good. That is not their primary purpose. And so the big issue with that then comes out with whatever gets the most clicks, whether it's harmful or, or not, is going to get promoted even more. So then you have these things that are getting the most clicks that then get prioritized by the algorithm because they're getting clicks, but usually it's the most extreme viewpoints. It's not the most moderate viewpoints that get the most clicks. It's the most extreme stuff. So now we have this era of disinformation where there's this, you know, some people say, well, I don't know what to trust anymore. Who do I trust? What is right and what's wrong? That's pretty upsetting. Like what is fact and what is fiction? So that's another really important phenomena um, to look at that, that we have to be critical thinkers in this day and age. We have to go to the source. We have to do our research. We can't just depend on what comes into our newsfeed. The other major issue with social media is that the algorithm feeds you what you're most likely to click on. So if you click on the New York Times, it's gonna feed you more New York Times. If you click on Breitbart News and alt-right newspaper, it's gonna feed you more Breitbart. So instead of your mind getting bigger, as you consume more information, your mind should get bigger, right? But if you go down the rabbit hole of only eating what they feed you, your mind actually gets narrower and smaller which is bizarre to think of because you're consuming more and more information. Another phenomenon that's really important just to be aware of right now, <clears throat> mental health crisis. This was already a problem before COVID, okay? Mental health has always been deprioritized by countries. It has not gotten the modicum of support or resources that physical healthcare has ever gotten ever in any country. Right. And not to say that it should, but that it, mental health care is real. Depression, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, these are real. I've seen them in my own life, my own family members. They're not a joke and they need, people need treatment. And then of course, what you had with COVID was all of these people all of a sudden losing support systems, losing community. Humans need each other. We are social beings. We're not created to exist on our own, to live life on our own. And so COVID exacerbated uh, the, uh, it, it exacerbated what was already happening with mental health. Uh, looking at this report in the US, since the COVID-19 pandemic began to spread in March, 2020, over 178,000 people in the United States have reported frequent suicidal ideation, meaning they are thinking about killing themselves. 37% of people reported having thoughts of suicide more than half or nearly every day in September, 2020. Horrifying. If we look at global, the next status from global statistics from the World Health Organization, Nearly 1 billion people live with a mental disorder and in low income countries, more than three quarters of people with the disorder don't receive treatment. Every year, close to 3 million people die due to substance abuse. In the US, we've had a big problem with the opioid epidemic. Every 40 seconds, a person dies by suicide. In the US, since COVID, suicide rates have gone In the military, in the army, they went up by 30%. And about 50% of mental health disorders start by age 14. So we have a major mental health crisis on our hands. People not getting the treatment they need, not having access. A lot of the time, the poorest people who need it the most don't have access. Another phenomenon that's important to think of from the leadership perspective is that finally, and I'm really excited about this, ESG, which means environmental, social, and governance is finally becoming mainstream. It kind of started out as a fringe movement and it was this idea that, okay, what if we invested in funds that could say that they were not having a negative effect on the climate, that could say that they have a sexual harassment policy in place, that we know has a board that's not corrupt. What if we invest in funds that are like that? Because not just because it's the right thing to do, but because they're more likely to succeed. Because if you don't have rampant sexual harassment, Women aren't more as likely to leave. If you're not destroying the environment, you don't face a huge reputational risk for destroying the environment. And I think that's part of why it's finally coming full circle and becoming mainstream is because there's money in it. I had lunch with a friend of mine the other day uh, who works at JP Morgan on sustainability. And he said, you know, bankers are flocking to this because they see that there's money in it. 
right? So the value proposition finally came out that, oh, this is actually a good way to make more money. But I think it's a really positive thing that ESG has, has come into the fore and that people are caring more about sustainability. So that's something also really important to think of because if you are running a company that like you know Facebook, for example, that is not doing enough when it comes to ESG, that is not protecting people, that is not taking responsibility for its actions. That's why the economist says, you know, Facebook has reached the reputational risk of our point of no return. That there's no going back. People literally will not use the platform. So if, you know, people don't want to use BP when there's a huge oil spill in the Gulf, right? Your being ESG is part of your brand and your reputation. And that's especially important to young people who really care about these issues. In Germany, I just covered the German elections for my show. Climate change was the most important issue for Germans in the election. The most important issue. It wasn't jobs. It wasn't education. It wasn't any of the things we would think of. It was climate change. Really matters to people. And then obviously the Nietzsche movement. As a women's rights activist, I think it, this was just such an amazing, long overdue movement where it finally, women finally said, this is not okay. Having workplaces where we are harassed, we are raped, we are assaulted, and then we're asked to sign non-disclosure agreements to say that it never happened and get paid off, or we're retaliated against, but that's not okay anymore. This is not the type of world that we want to live in. And that it's not okay for companies to have cultures like that where men with lots of power are able to get away with it just because they are men with lots of power. So you see in this graph, you know, some of the women that have replaced uh, men who were accused of sexual assault. So Dominique Strauss-Kahn, famously the IMF, to Christine Lagarde, Andrew Cuomo very, very recently, Kathy Hochul, Charlie Rose, Christiane Amanpour. So you have government, you have international organization, you have journalism. It's been all over. You obviously had Harvey Weinstein, the film industry. Every industry has had a Me Too. So I think that's so important to think about because as leaders, how do we create workplaces that are safe for women? It's not as easy as you might think, right? You really have to be thoughtful about that. And how do you make sure that when there are perpetrators in the workplace, that they are dealt with, that they are held accountable, that they are fired, that people who report it are not the ones fired. These are things that have become important as leaders. Not having a sexual harassment policy in a company is not okay anymore. Not having a chain of command or having an HR that says, you know, let's push it under the rug. What do we have to do to get you to stop talking about this? It doesn't work. That's a big, big phenomena as well that I, I think we need to pay attention to as leaders. So I love this slide. Um, the world needs a new type of leader. Nobody wants these guys anymore. Uh, I mean, you know, Trump's angry epithets and sexism and racism, um, Putin, who is just like this ridiculous man who rides around on horseback um, with no shirt on, Lukashenko, Lukashenko was beat in the elections by Svetlana Tikhonovskaya in Belarus, but she was not allowed to take over because he's a dictator. But the people came out in the streets to say, we don't want you, Lukashenko. We voted for this woman. This is who we want in power. Nobody wants you anymore. So, you know, a lot of these leaders, what they do instead of shifting, instead of adapting and saying, hmm, people don't like me. What's going on? Maybe I need to look inside and see how I can change my leadership. They just employ repressive tactics, authoritarian tactics, uh, violence, uh, misinformation, and, um, uh, and control tactics to stick hold on to their power instead of actually changing themselves. And I think that's what we're seeing with the Republican party right now is this unwillingness to come to terms with the fact that I don't think most Republicans want to be the party of Trump. They don't agree with him. They don't think he's a good person. They don't like the effect he's had on the party but they're not, they don't have enough courage to stand up and say that. So who do they want? They want these leaders. So when we talk about the changing face of leadership, I was thinking about this. It's really, it's actually physically sometimes the face, right? We've got Ai Jin Poo here, 
head of the National Domestic Workers Alliance that organizes and protects women that are, you know, housekeeping and cleaning, um, that are um, caretakers. Obviously, Michelle Obama is like the most popular woman to ever hit the planet. Uh, everybody loves Michelle Obama. Um, Beth Comstock of GE, Jacinda Ardern, Alicia Garza of the Black Lives Movement. Why And why do people want these leaders? It's not just because they're women. And it's not to say that people only want women, but that some of the male leadership has just been so toxic and so accepting of things like sexual assault. I think there's also a fear. But I really want to make clear that I think that women don't necessarily just want women leaders. They want collaborative leaders. They want inclusive leaders. They want feminist leaders. And you can be a man and be a feminist. It just means believing in equal rights between women and men. So we think about leaders too in the changing face of leadership. I think young people have really shown an amazing lean towards leadership. My favorite, I love Greta Thunberg from, um, you know, in the climate change movement. Uh, her most recent, maybe you saw her saying to the UN, um, at, at, at the UN General Assembly, carbon neutral, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no carbon emissions, blah, blah, blah. Basically saying this is all BS and you're not actually making the change. The world is on fire. Floods are happening. You need to do something more. Right, and she's a teenager. March for Our Lives. I was blown out of the water at March for Our Lives. The way that Emma Gonzalez, who was from Parkland High School, one of the schools that experienced a mass shooting, held the stage and she just stopped talking for the amount of seconds that it took for the, the mass shooting to happen. Everybody was silent and it was hundreds of thousands of people, which is, I think, one of the biggest protests on the National Mall. It was all organized by teenagers, right? And then they lobbied Walmart and all these companies to stop selling automatic weapons. And they were successful in some cases. So I also think we're seeing the younger generation leading. The younger generation, let's face it too, really good at technology. They are digital natives. They grow up with technology. They know how to use it. They know how to hack into stuff. They're amazing with technology and figuring out how to use technology to create social good. So if we think about, you know, who do we need to be as leaders or what is really important based on all these trends for the leaders of the future? Transactional versus transformational leadership. So the old style of leadership was very transactional, which means it's based on a system of risks and rewards. If you do this, I pay you more money. If you don't do this, you get fired. Transformational leadership literally means lifting other people up to reach their full potential. It's about valuing people as human beings. It's about seeing them for their full selves. It's about mentoring. It's about supporting. It's about helping people grow to their next level. It's about giving people responsibility. It's not about saying, this is your narrow job description, do this, stay in your lane, and you know, uh, maybe you'll get a promotion based on a very shoddy performance review system. So that's really important is transformational leadership. Can you transform the people that work for you and that are around you? Empathy. I've, I have trained over 2000 people leaders now at this point in my life. And every single time I say, you know, based on the trends of what's going on in the world, what is the most important thing for leaders to have? What's the most important trait? Every single time it's empathy. Every single time empathy comes out on top. And so I have a picture here of Jacinda Ardern because this is empathy. When there was the Christchurch shooting where somebody walked in and shot um, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, Muslim people in a mosque, she's wearing the hijab to show I am with you, not sympathy, which is, oh, I feel bad for you. It's, I am here. I am doing my best to put myself in your shoes. That's empathy. It's empathy for somebody who's home and has three kids that are out of school because of COVID. It's somebody who, who's, whose parent has Parkinson's or COVID and now they're faced with elderly care 
and they have, you know, a, a senile mother wandering around the house and they're trying to get stuff done, but they're trying to also take care of their mother. It's about empathy for people's life situations, about empathy for disabilities, including invisible disabilities, myself included, of having empathy to know that just because, you know, somebody can get up and walk every day and wake up at 5 a.m. and feel bright as a, as a flower that not everybody can do that because of physical ailments. That's empathy. It's making those accommodations for people based on where they're at. Inclusion. So this is the other piece of it. Um, we've seen the rise of the chief diversity officer was, wasn't even a position that existed. And it's because inclusion is just so important. So it's been really interesting because I've been involved in diversity, equity, and inclusion for a while now, is the beginning was about diversity. It was, how do we get more people of color to work for us? How do we get more women? How do we recruit them? It was about recruitment. How do we get them to our firm? But then there was the realization, oh, we recruited these people, but they're leaving. What gives? Like, what, why is this happening? What's going on? Because if you don't have inclusion, it doesn't matter if people who are diverse don't feel as if people are embracing of them, people are inclusive of them, they'll leave. So I think really excellent leadership at this point is about being inclusive. And it's about creating a culture of inclusion where value is, um, where people's differences are really valued. So one thing that I like to say uh, is, you know, instead of looking for culture fit, can you look for culture add? What does somebody add to your culture? And realizing that if you have the same people all the time, you're just gonna reach group think. There won't be creativity, there won't be innovation. Inclusion is incredibly important. So I just, this is a Corn Ferry report that came out last year about um, the uh, inclusive, the dif disciplines of inclusive leaders. And I love what they say here. Inclusiveness is the new currency of power, influence, and effectiveness. That you are, if you are not inclusive, you will not innovate. You will create backlashes. You will not create a culture because inclusion is not just about including people of color, including people who look different. It's creating a supportive, enabling culture where people stand up for what's right. People respect one another. People care about people next to them. People don't sabotage one another. It's not just about, you know, oh, we have to be inclusive of people who are different. It's, it's bigger than that. It's about creating an incredibly supportive ecosystem where people are partnering across different sectors and um, you know ideating together where they're agents for change. So inclusion is so critically important for leaders right now. If you have not done the work when it comes to inclusion, you will not succeed. Courage. So I talk a lot about courage in my women's leadership course, which I will um, get to in a bit about what, what exactly that looks like. This is not courage of, you know, courage to, to, you know, climb a mountain, to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. This is way harder courage. It's emotional courage. So the courage to be honest and transparent. Leaders during COVID who were transparent with their people. I just love Jacinda Ardern. Jacinda came out in her pajamas after putting her baby to bed and said, oh, I'm so sorry. Like my baby was crying and put my toddler to bed. I'm sorry, my mama jammies. But like, you have to, you know, this is what's going on with COVID. Be nice to your neighbor, blah, blah, blah. She was giving people daily updates because she knew people needed to hear that. And she was honest about it. It wasn't like Trump who was like, ah, oh, it's the flu. Doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Blowing it out of proportion. She was honest with herself, right? For Trump, he was just trying to push it under the rug, just like, frankly, he did with all of his sexual assault and all of his mistresses and all of his payments and everything else he's ever done in his life, his tax returns. He was just trying to push it under the rug instead of being honest and upfront. And as leaders, we have to be honest. To make unpopular choices, the courage to make unpopular choices. So, you know, one thing I realized is that uh, women were talked a lot about, you know, doing so well during COVID. But a lot of the things that were talked about, like why they did well, these women leaders, fit within gender norms. They collaborated, they were communicators, they were pro-social. Yes, all of those are great. But one thing nobody ever said in any of the studies was that they were courageous. Because how popular is it to shut down an economy when most people, maybe with the exception of Germany now, vote on jobs? Not popular. So to make those unpopular choices when you know that they're right, 
I also have Angela Merkel up here. I just did a show last night on um, Angela Merkel stepping down as chancellor and who's going to replace her and what that will look like. Angela Merkel said, you know, we have a history of the Holocaust here. These Syrian refugees have nowhere to go. We are the wealthiest economy in Europe. We have plenty of jobs. We have plenty of space. We're going to take them. She just as easily could have gone the other way. It was not the most popular decision, but she did it because that is what was right. She paid attention to her true north. And we're gonna talk about that next. And then I, um, the courage to ask for help, right? To say, I don't know all the answers or I don't know the answer to that. I'm participating in a conference next week where I love it. It's kind of, it's very participatory. And when I teach my feminist leadership course, I leave two and a half hours per class because I know that I don't have all the answers. And I have a room of women who have amazing life experiences to share an incredible leadership acumen that can absolutely add and support and maybe differ with what I'm saying. I know that I don't have all the answers and you have to be able to admit that as a leader, not to say, you know, can tell how much I love Trump, but you know, I know more than the generals. Like, no, you actually, there's literally no way that you know more than the generals. You, you've never even served in the US military. You said that you had bone spurs from a, a fake letter that your dad paid off a doctor for so you didn't have to serve in the Vietnam War. You don't know more than the generals, I'm sorry. Uh, and to be vulnerable, right? To be vulnerable and to open up, to say, you know, I have too much on my plate. I really need people's help with this. Or, you know, maybe I'm having, you know, as a leader, I just had a baby. I'm having, you know, I, I'm not sleeping. I'm having postpartum depression, whatever it is. I really need you as a team to step up instead of just assigning it and then checking out. People will step up to help you, but you have to be vulnerable and let them in on what's going on. Not all the time. You still have to stay, you know, and be the beacon when there's a storm that doesn't, doesn't sway, but to also have that courage to be vulnerable, to tell your story, to share that you were not always at the top. Uh, one thing that I love, a big phenomena that's come about are called um, F up nights. And it's where people get on stage and they talk about a time where they majorly screwed up. And I love them because they're so human and real because none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. And when one person talks about a mistake that they've made, it like unleashes like the sigh from the audience of like, oh my gosh, you're kidding. You're the head of this and you make mistakes. I can't believe it. And we need to get more comfortable with failure, especially women who have a fear of failure. And to admit where we're not strong, say, hey, I am not good at this. Therefore, I need your help. Right? To understand where we're not the best and where our strengths are and where we should be at the front of the line. That's courage. Self-awareness. So as I mentioned, I've been training people leaders for a while now from, you know, men and women from all over the world. We have to be self-aware as a leader. Lukashenko, Putin, Trump, they're not self-aware. They don't, they don't necessarily know what drives them. Why are they making decisions? I mean, I think Putin is very strategic, but for him, it's all about power. So this is an exercise I work with women on in the women's leadership course of figuring out what are your talents? What are your strengths? What are your personality attributes? Are you always the funniest from the room? What are your, your values, your three values that, that can guide your decision-making? What is your purpose? What's your overarching purpose? What do you want people to say about you when you're gone? And then what's your social capital? Those are things that are intrinsic to you. They don't leave you because you didn't get a job or you got a divorce or you didn't get the part in the play. Those are always true to you. And so I call that your North Star. So when you have a difficult decision to make, you can lean back onto your intrinsic power map and see where it leads you. What is your mission of leadership? So self-awareness is really important. And that means willing to look at ourselves, which is being vulnerable, to admit where we're weak. That, that's hard. It's not easy work to admit where our leadership might have failed and we really pissed people off and to figure out how to make sure we don't do it again. And so this is the other like big realization that I think I've had is that leaders today need to, because of the global nature of the problems we're facing, 
whether it's a global pandemic or climate change or rise in populism, that are poverty, gender-based violence, there's so many global issues out there. I think that leaders need community. So many leaders at the top, especially, exist feeling alone. Like they have to have all the answers, like they have to be the kind of, you know, stalwart, you know, um, the, the top and nobody can ever see that they, they, they are, are scared or that they have, you know, they, they don't know what's next. And what I've seen, I've been running the Women's Leadership Program now since uh, for about a year, and I have just seen women thrive when it comes to being part of community. Women leaders thrive when they have a small group of women that they can trust, that are authentic, where they feel like they can lean on them, where they can depend on them, where they can talk about the similar issues that they face without facing judgment, that's when you see leaders thrive. I don't think, like I said at the beginning of this talk, we don't exist in a vacuum. Humans, we're social animals. We're supposed to be in cooperation and collaboration with one another. <clears throat> and so I don't think that that's something that's very really talked about very much in terms of leadership. But I really believe leaders need to find a community. They need to find a really, really solid support system, whether it's you know, from the Women's Leadership Challenge or your family, whatever it is. Those people you can go to for advice who you really trust, who have your back, who can support you and encourage you when you have an idea that might seem crazy or you wanna start a business or leave your job and start a nonprofit. Who are those cheerleaders that you have? And then the other thing that I think is incredibly important is that leaders need to create community. I was having a, um, excuse me. I was having a talk with a co-working space headquarters the other day and we were talking about the future of work. And I really believe that the future of work is about community. It's about creating community. How do you create community within your workspace? How do you make people feel like they have that? And how do you do it remotely? And you might say, well, it's impossible. I'll tell you that it's not because I've done it. I've done it with 32 women from 15 countries where you know, a woman in the Netherlands and a woman in uh, America are raising money by doing hiking and walking and climbing for another woman's NGO in Kenya. Okay, that's the bond that they formed. They're a community. So don't tell me that that's impossible remotely because I've seen it. None of these women have ever met one another. It's totally possible. You have to figure out how to create community. And I have a white paper on creating a um, community in an inclusive virtual environment. I'll just post uh, the, the, um, the link to it below the, the video so you can download it. Okay, so I wanna deviate here. I've mentioned the Women's Leadership Challenge. I wanna deviate here just to dive a little bit deeper into it. It's different. It, I, I went into the bookstore the other day and I saw that Harvard Business Review just had a book on women's leadership and it was all about how do women get to the top and the obstacles they face. It wasn't actually about women leading. What we saw during COVID is that women leading the way that they were leading, some of these things that I just talked about was why things were succeeding. I think that women do things differently or at least when they lean into feminist values, when they lean into collaboration, transformational leadership and cooperation and compassion, they lead differently. So this course is really about teaching you to step into your power and figure out how to change the world with the support of other women. What's also really exciting is that I've now created a network of almost 50 women and I network women intentionally with one another. So if I know you wanna start your own business, I'm gonna match you with an entrepreneur. If I know you wanna start an impact investing fund in Nigeria, I'm gonna pair you with someone else in impact investing. I actually had a woman who wanted to be a children's book author and we literally had somebody in the cohort that, or maybe in the other court, that was a children's book author. So I paired them together and she just published her second children's book today. It's just so cool. <clears throat> so the course modules are, like I said, not what you would normally expect from a women's leadership course. I call the first one deconstructing your inner patriarchy, which is realizing the way that systems have told us that as women, we have less value which I think, excuse me, I'm just plugging in my cord, which I think affects the way that we 
our confidence, it affects our capabilities, it affects our dreams and goals, what we think we're capable of. A deep dive into feminist leadership, which a lot of things that we just talked about, collaboration, courage. <clears throat> Looking at feminist foreign policy with the more policy oriented people when I do my DC group of what does it mean to have a feminist foreign policy where it's not all about boots on the ground, but it's about peace and it's about human rights and it's about civil society and it's about dialogue those we need in the US as well. How do you lean into your strengths and figure out how to feel where you're, neat, where you're weak? How do you speak truth to power? We do a lot of analysis of power. What are the different types of power? So like there's direct power, indirect and invisible. And how do you confront different types of power? Creating institutional change. Had an amazing woman, my former boss, talk about you know, leading the charge for federal paid leave for the State Department, which had never been a thing. They didn't have paid leave. Uh, that intrinsic power map we talked about, exercises to figure out all those things about yourself. What is your true north as a leader? How do you create change, whether it's on DEI, whether it's on creating policy change? What, what are the steps to creating institutional change? And then I love the last one. I hope I'm allowed to curse because it's not cable television, but building your own damn table, which has kind of become our slogan, thanks to Tori Burt, excuse me, not Tori Burt. Thank you to Tori Graff, who is the first woman to sign up for the program, amazing entrepreneur. She's also been our biggest sponsor. Uh, thank you to Tori for coining that term. She said, why are we always trying to get a seat at everyone else's table? Why don't we just build our own damn table? So we talk about feminist entrepreneurship and how do you build your own table and how do you embed it with principles of feminist leadership, of ethics and values so you don't end up like Facebook on the firing squad and at Congress. That's not feminist leadership, frankly. <clears throat> so it's an amazing program. And then as part of the program, the women also create what's called a feminist change initiative. So I mentioned Leslie who wanted to create a children's book series for children who've experienced trauma. This is her first book that just came out about two weeks ago, a story about bullying. We have Jackie on our right, who's an advocacy lead for um, a plastics coalition and her feminist change initiative was really thinking about how do we pass legislation when it comes to um, preventing the use of single use plastics and plastic pollution. How do we create new terminology around it so people get it? How do we create new partnerships? How do we not just speak to the choir but how do we speak outside? <clears throat> so women are encouraged to do a change initiative so that they can then take that to the next level after the course is over but they also join this global community of women so I now do things like an ask and give circle where you can come and say, you know, this is what I need. I'm looking for clients. I'm looking for a speaking engagement. I'm looking for help publishing a book. And someone else will say, oh, I know somebody. This interconnected system of women who trust one another because they've all been through this program to help one another. You know, because I think one problem with women is that every single woman out there has been sabotaged at one point or another by another woman. And that leaves you with this sense of distrust of like, mm, does she really have my back? And in this community, you don't get into the program if you don't have other women's back. If that is not your intention, I will not take you. <laughs> so I'm being honest. So everybody trusts one another. Um, these are just some of the, the testimonials that I've had from the program. Uh, both of these women on here, Rachel and Lakaisha, I'm incredibly proud to say that they both said that it's changed their lives, uh, which makes me feel like I can get up and go. My work here is done. Uh, just really, just so proud of, of the women and what they've gone through and what they've created. Uh, Lakaisha was just, just got a, an award yesterday uh, for leadership. She was promoted from, to you know, she was in charge of one state to be in charge of an entire region. She also was just on the news for raising money for women with cancer um, in Chesapeake Bay, Virginia. Rachel is the head of an organization that works with indigenous communities to drive community-driven health interventions. Rachel has really stepped into her power. She's getting speaking engagements. She's building herself as a thought leader. She's really on the front lines, whereas before she was a little bit shy and not really as willing to put herself out there. She's very happy to put the organization out there. Now she's putting herself out there and she's an incredible woman. You should watch her TED talk if you haven't seen it. Rachel Cadell Monroe. Hi, I'm Christine Keck, and I took the Women's Leadership Challenge in early 2021, and I thought it was fantastic. Samantha and Mary delivered thoughtful content that really helped me and my cohort of seven other amazing women think about leadership and power structures and how 
existing power structures frequently don't work for all groups of people. We had amazing conversations about the role of power, namely who has it, who has a right to it, and how do we think about changing existing power dynamics so that they do work for all people. Samantha and Mary also had a lot of exercises for us to help us think through our strengths, what we want in this life, and to really think about what holds us back, and ideally to think about how do we go and chase those dreams of ours. I highly recommend the class. Hi, my name is Rachel, and I was in cohort C, the Stacey Abrahams cohort of the Women's Leadership Challenge run by Samantha Carlin. Um, I was with seven other incredible women, and uh, it was a really amazing experience. Samantha told me before I started that this could possibly change my life. And I was like, mm, I'm not sure about that. But I did it, and you know what? <laughs> I think it might have done. I feel now so much more empowered um, as a woman leader, as a feminist leader, realizing my skills and leadership that involve kindness, caring, empathy, solidarity, humanity, um, and being uh, part of a collective leadership rather than an individual feat. So thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Mary, for this incredible course. And I thoroughly recommend it to everybody. Best part of the workshop was the, the network of women that I've gotten to know. We've become a very tight knit group. Um, and just the very open, honest conversations we've had about our struggles, about our ideas, where we want to go have been invaluable. It's been the best part of the workshop for me. Hi, I'm Kate Burns, CEO of Catapult. When I very first started Samantha Carlin's Women's Leadership Program, I was actually negotiating for the job that I have now. And like so many women, I doubted, um, was afraid to ask for what I really wanted. Was I making the right decision? And so I found that the exercises that we did, especially the ones that had to do with what my values were, what my values alignment was uh, incredibly helpful. And in fact, gave me the very breakthrough I needed that then went on to give me the confidence to ask for what I wanted and frankly, successfully get it. So I think it's a terrific opportunity uh, to go and do some deeper dives that you think you've done, but you probably really haven't <laughs> lately. And also the women that I met and now I'm fortunate enough to call friends and colleagues proved invaluable. One of the, the second piece behind trying to get this clarity on, on values alignment for myself was I really wanted to build a global network of powerful women leaders. And I did just that. I really didn't know what to expect. After speaking with Samantha and then being selected, I realized I had made the right choice to invest in my personal development as a woman and learn more about feminist leadership. As a Black woman in America, the principles of feminist leadership were often muted and went unspoken as I held many positions in male-dominated industries or familial norms warned us against going against the patriarchal systems in place. The sessions I participated in fulfilled me in so many ways, and the women I met are now fast friends and sisters. I was immediately intrigued by how many different topics we would be going over and all of the different types of curriculum that she had or was going to provide for us to learn and to study with. And I also really liked, once I was accepted into the program, that the challenge members that were a part of this first group, it was small. It was, you know, less than 10 people. So I really appreciated the way that I was able to build relationships with these women and learn from them and their different circumstances and lifestyles um, and take those learnings with me for the rest of my life. I know that if I had not taken this course, I would not be as confident in the decisions that I'm making today to change my life. So being able to take this course and know clear-headedly this is the right next decision for me and this is the type of 
company, relationship, position that I want to be in is something that I could not be more grateful for. And what you get is tools for yourself, tools for yourself as someone. So we'll stop there. I think that's plenty of testimonials. They do make me very proud. And I love actually just seeing all these women's faces because some of them were in my, my very first cohort that I ran in October. And when I really wasn't sure what was going to happen and didn't feel like I had all the answers. Uh, it's part of being as an entrepreneur is, you know, taking that initial first leap is always the hardest part. Um, so that's the Women's Leadership Challenge. So if you're interested in the Women's Leadership Challenge, the current cohorts are full. We're accepting applications right now for January, an in-person cohort within Washington, DC. And also there'll be probably one or two virtual cohorts. So I'll post the link in the chat, but it's empowerglobal.net is the website slash new slash online challenge, or just click on Women's Leadership Challenge. Uh, the other thing that my company Empower Global does do is we do inclusive leadership training for organizations. Uh, which can include inclusive leadership, uh, unconscious bias. We've had a lot of big clients, including Verizon, AB and Bev, RB, Salsify, Slalom, and on and on and on. Um, I also have a free white paper on inclusive virtual facilitation techniques if you're interested. I think I've learned all of them now uh, on how to uh, virtually uh, facilitate in a way that is inclusive to people. I think what really sets us apart is that we're a global team. So I have trainers all over the world. So we offer training in English, French, Spanish, German, and Hebrew, uh, and have local trainers on the ground. And it's really, um, because my master's degree is in international relations, it's really looking at how do we, how do we make this land? So if you have an unconscious bias training, how do we fix it to make sense with Israeli culture? What are the nuances that you need for France? The caste system in India, if you don't include that in unconscious bias training for India, you're, it's just dumb. Like you're, you, you don't know what you're doing. Um, so really making those cultural adjustments. The other thing that we have the capacity to do due to a, a partnership with an amazing company called Equal Reality is to utilize virtual reality. Where, and the power of virtual reality is to create exactly the first thing I talked about when it comes to leadership, which is empathy. Putting on a headset and putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else that is different from you is incredibly powerful and transformative. So we do do trainings that are in person with VR headsets. Then we also do trainings using their um, flat screen virtual reality where you don't actually need a headset, but it's still virtual reality. So that I think also really separates us. And as Stelios would say, it's cutting, cutting edge. Stelios and Glenn would say it's cutting edge. Uh, so if you're interested in training, just email info at empowerglobal.net or you can check out our website for more, uh, more, more information and let us know what you're looking for. And so I just want to end on this note, which is that um, I'm working on a book on feminist leadership right now with an amazing woman named Lena Abirafa, who's a Lebanese women's rights activist. And we're calling it Start Where You Stand. And so I think the message I want to end with is with regards to the changing face of leadership is that you don't have to be the CEO of a company anymore to create change. You don't have to be at the top. You can create significant change on your own. I started my own talk show, as I mentioned, on women's rights and global politics with eight viewers, including my mother. She was the only one who ever asked any questions. <laughs> and now, you know, my one of my last episodes had 95,000 views. It's just me, a producer who's been absolutely gracious and lovely enough to do it pro bono, and an intern. I started it on my own. I used my network to get guests. Start where you stand. So you think about leadership. You don't have to think about, well, when I get to this position, I'm going to lead. But you can lead right now, right where you are, right where you stand. You just need the tools, the courage, and the support to do so. That's it. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. On your, um, on your leader, Women's Leadership Challenge, uh, you had 13 modules. Yeah. How, 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 uh, how do you go through the course from a, is it, is it twice a week, uh, three days? Is it 13 weeks? Just, just a quick logistics. Yeah. So right now the way I'm doing it, it's actually every other week for 11 weeks. Okay. Two okay. and a half hours every other week. Uh, and the, some of the modules are together. So, you know, they'll be speaking truth to power and something else are in the same module or confidence building and your intrinsic power map will be together. Uh, so, but it's a long course. And, and that was the intention behind the design as well, because 
I had, I've put together conferences before women, but you know, you feel good for three or five days, your best friends, and then you leave and there's no follow-up, there's no continuity. There's, you know, you're, you're, you're in a space where you feel like you can try things, but I wanted women to take a class and then go into the real world and try using the framework to speak truth to power and then come back and say, Hey, that totally backfired on me. Like, what do I do differently? <laughs> or, you know, like learn courageous conversations and then actually go out to have them. So that's why it's space. And also I have a lot of busy women. So that's why it used, it was every other week, then it was every week and now it's every other week again. Well, it kind of, you get a chance to field test it then, right? Go out and you, and you go out and say, that's okay. Exactly the point. It's, there's no point if you're not going to use it in the real world. That's true. Absolutely true. You know what I noticed on your five points that you, your last five, when you had empathy, inclusion, uh, emotional courage, self-awareness and finding and creating community. On, on the fifth one, you know what I noticed? What? That was that was that was similar. Everybody was smiling. Yeah. Every 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 person had a smile on on, on the uh, on the screenshot. So so congratulations on that. You know, you mentioned uh, Angela Merkel. Yeah. Um, I used to work at the um, I was at the New York Stock Exchange for, hmm. for eighteen years, and I remember at one point having a conversation with. Um, at that point, he was the. Um, uh, uh, former head of international at the stock exchange, and I remember him him telling the story of when, uh, right after the unification of Germany, right, they they had a, a delegation come to visit visit us in New York, and she was part of that delegation, mm. and, I, and I remember him telling me the story of how, you know, a lot of times those international delegations are more about just you know photo opportunities and you know, kind of, kind of just being part of the crowd. What I remember him telling me about her visit was, you know, and this, and, and, you know, she came, there was this East German woman that came and, wow, she didn't fool around. She had questions, she had points, she wanted answers. It wasn't your typical quote unquote, you know, fluffy type type visit. And he, and he said he, he had never worked so hard for a meeting because she was <laughs> grueling him on just capitalism and the markets and how does it work and, so I, I I think it's interesting that you had her uh, and you featured her a couple of a couple of times in, on on today's talk. You know, she's you, you, so you, popular. Everybody loves her. Nobody wants her to step down. I mean, it's, it's yeah, incredible. They, I, I I think they're going to miss her. I, I you know she's she's been at the helm a, a long time. You know, with with empathy, one of the things you you, you hear a lot about with uh, artificial intelligence and, and and all of that is how how do you how do you replicate that? What what you just said about the virtual reality side of it, I, I, I hadn't considered that, but what a, what a fascinating way to put yourself, yeah. you know, to quote an old Elvis song, you know, walk a mile in my shoes, yes. right? to, put, to put, to put, to put, uh, to put the, the, you know, that kind of headset on and then feel what it feels like. That's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty powerful stuff. You know, um, I, I've done a bunch of work with, with governance and, and whatnot over, over, over my lifetime. Confer the conference board, just came out. Uh, they just released it, I think, last night. They just did a, a recent survey on, on. You had an earlier point about men mental health, mm. um, and, and they just and they did kind of like a rapid survey. I just I actually just pulled it up, and it's available. But they were talking about uh, uh, workplace burnout. Eight out of ten people are, are concerned about mental health. Through the pandemic, they said uh, almost seventy-seven percent worried more about mental health. Than physical health, which I thought was 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 fascinating, and to to the basic theme of your of your presentation, no surprise, the, the people who reported the most uh, workload pressure and suffering was women, mm -hmm. 56 percent, and then millennials at at six at sixty percent mm -hmm. as as a group. So mm -hmm. it's just it, it's interesting, and as you said too, you you kind of had the workplace boundaries were blurred, right? How how are you trying to do do your job when you're trying to do second grade homework? Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, that at the at the same time, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's it, it it's been it's been a it's been a challenge. I think without without a doubt. You, you mentioned groupthink. That's always dangerous, right? It's too it's too easy just to you know everybody starts nodding. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've done I've done some some teaching here over the course of the pandemic, and and a lot of the points you brought up, I I've been kind of trying to reemphasize with my students mm -hmm. as they get ready to to enter into the workforce. And I what I what I was struck by what you said was on, on one of your points, it's not so much about the ascent to the top, but it's about leading. And, and yeah, okay, maybe you get the job, but it, it's, you know, there's a difference between 
right? And they always say there's a difference between managing and leading, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, but but the fact that uh, on, on your example, it was more about that journey as opposed to, well, I've, I've now got the top spot. I, I think that that's a very, very, inter very interesting point as, as you go through. And, and certainly on, on emotional courage, we, we all need to be better listeners and, and, and be able to, to take in, take in uh, criticism and points mm -hmm. and feedback and be able to speak our mind and, and let our guard down once in a while, right? And let people know that perhaps, you know, I do need help. Let me put my hand up. No, I can't. I can't say yes to everything. Or maybe I've said yeah. yes to too many things. Can you take one back now and lend and lend a hand, right? As as it as it as it kind of plays out. So I mean, some some amazing points. You know, on, on D, DEI, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, a lot a lot of people are, people are drafting uh, position statements. They're putting it in their value statement. You know, a lot, a lot of what what I what I've seen. I and I and I, and I think you hit upon this point at all as well. I think sometimes the hardest part is the I, yeah. is the inclusion part, right? It's great to have, you know, you can have as many statistics as you want and you could, you could, you know, you could talk the talk, but if you don't walk the walk, right? If, if even with all of that, if somebody still feels isolated in the workplace and, and, and the like, then, then obviously we're not, we're not, we're not doing a good job with, with it, certainly as, as a, as a you know, as a policy or, or a credo, really, when you think about it, when you, when you come back and, and, and focus on it like that. Uh, yeah. So just some amazing, some amazing topics. I mean, again, between empathy, inclusion, community is so important, so important. And, and as you said, you know, uh, you know we, we, we talk a lot about mentorship as well, right? People need role models. Yeah. People need mentors. And as you said, you really need somebody who really has your back, not just, not, not just some, you know, lip service to that, but really when the chips are down, you know, they're going to, they're going to be there, uh, you know, for you. And, and as, and as it, as it always plays out, but uh, fascinating conversation, uh, yeah. wonderful work. And, you know, thank you for joining us today. You were just, just terrific. Uh, how far in advance do you, do you book your, uh, your guests for the talk show? Um, it depends. I mean, I've been, you know, if something's breaking, um, I, I've gotten guests the same day. Uh, oh, it's exactly. amazing. I like, I got the special rapporteur for human rights in Belarus, like the day of, um, through LinkedIn. It was like you know, unbelievable. Um, but then there's guests that, you know, are, have a little bit crazier schedules. Like I think we booked, uh, last night's guest who was the only American delegate to an international delegation to the German elections about two weeks ago. And then we had her on the show on Wednesday. Uh, she was terrific. I actually sent it to his German friend and he was like, she was spot on. I was like, oh, my German friend said she was spot on. Like, that's really success. You, 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 you know, you hit, hit it out of the park then. Right. right? <laughs> you didn't, Who cares you, about the Americans? What did the Germans think? <laughs> yeah, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't miss the bullseye. That's, right, that's exactly. for sure. That's for sure. Well, listen, thanks for joining us today. I mean, congratulations on all, on all your good work. Thank you. Wishing you the best of luck in the future. Uh, I mean, you've, you've, you got a lot on your plate. You got a lot on your plate. And there's certainly no shortage of news out there. And, and you're, you know, you're, you're rushing right into it. You're not, you know, you're, you're not, you know, you're right there in the forefront. Uh, and that takes a lot of courage. And you're, in, and you're empowering all the people around you. So congratulations on that. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you maybe again in the future. Yeah, I love that. It was a pleasure. All right. And take good care of yourself. Take care. Bye-bye.